how do proof trees work for first order logic? Let's take a look. Hello everyone, welcome to The Attic. My name is Mark Jago, I'm a philosopher in the UK. This is part of a series of videos on proof trees in logic and in this video we're going to be looking at first order logic rules. Okay, so first up, make sure you've seen the previous videos on propositional logic because we're going to be reusing those rules. There should be a link to that around here somewhere if I've got it working right. In this video, we're going to introduce the new rules that we need for first order logic. We're going to see how they work. We're going to see how rules work for identity and look at some examples. Okay, so if that sounds good to you, give this video a big old thumbs up. That really helps me out. And why not subscribe to the channel? So the two bits of good news when we get to do trees for first order logic are, first, they work in exactly the same way as proof trees did for propositional logic. The strategy and the technique is the same. Second bit of good news, all the rules that we looked at before, we're still going to use. So the majority of the rules we've learned already, basically we just add some extra rules for dealing with the quantifiers. So for the quantifiers, we're going to need four extra rules. One for dealing with the universal quantifier, one for dealing with the existential quantifier, and one for dealing with the universal quantifier when it's negated, and one for dealing with the existential when it's negated. And then later on in the video, I'm going to show you how to deal with cases where we've got identity and where we've got non-identity. OK, let's start off with the simplest case first, the negated quantifiers. These are really simple. When we've got a negated universal quantifier, basically that means the same thing as an existential quantifier. So if not everyone's happy, then somebody isn't happy. So we can change not for all x a into there is an x, not a. And similarly, the negated existential is basically going to be a universal. So if it's not the case that someone's happy, if no one's happy, that means everyone is unhappy. OK, so in general, not there is an x a, that is going to become for all x, not a. And then if you want to, once you've applied those rules, you can tick them off to say you're done with that sentence. You don't have to come back to it. OK, so those are the two easy cases. Now we're going to look at the slightly trickier cases of the universal and the existential. Let's start with the universal. So if we've got an open branch that has got everyone is happy, let's say, on it, what can we infer from that? Well, we can infer that each particular person is happy. OK, so if we've got for all x, fx, and we've also got Anna on our branch, like we've got something with the name A in it, then we could infer that Anna is happy, FA. OK, and we can do this for each particular person. So what our rule is going to be doing is it's going to be instantiating the universal quantifier with a particular constant. So we're going to be going from for all x A to A on its own, but with all the x's in it replaced by this constant. C should be a constant that we've already got in the tree if we've got any at all. OK, so if we've already used some name like A or B or C, we can reuse it to instantiate our universal quantifier. If we don't have any constants in the tree, then we can introduce a new one. OK, so it's not like if we haven't got any names, we can't use this rule. We can. We use a new constant, but we should avoid using new constants if we've already got some there in the tree or rather in the branch already. OK, so this thing here means the sentence that's just like the A up here, but all the X's in it get replaced by C, where C is some constant or name. OK, that's a pretty abstract way of putting the rule. So let's look at an example and see how it works. OK, so suppose I've got this open branch somewhere in a tree and it's got a universally quantified sentence for all x, fx. And it's also got this other stuff that includes some constants a, b and c. OK, so there I've got three old constants like ones I've already used a, b, c. So I can apply my universal instantiation rule so I can add to my tree f, a. I can add to my tree fb 
and I can add to my tree F, C. Okay, really important point here. I can reuse this rule as many times as I like, once for each constant that I've got in that branch. So it would be a really bad idea to tick it off at this point. We shouldn't tick it off because we can come back and repeat using that rule. We can use it again and again. And it might be that I don't stop there. Maybe later on in this branch, I'm going to introduce some other names, right? D, E, so on, okay? Then if I do that, I can come back up to this sentence here and use the instantiation rule again. So basically what the rule is saying is, look at the whole branch, doesn't matter whether it happens before or after the universal sentence. If you've got any constants on there, you can put those constants into the universal quantifier and you can do that as many times as you want. By the way, I've added these lines here to show you where the rule is being applied, but you don't really need to do that. You could just write this as one long kind of list of sentences, one after the other. It would be perfectly fine to write it out like this, just one line after the other. I sometimes put those lines in basically just to show you where I applied a rule, but you don't really need to do that. And in fact, it saves a bit of space if you don't do it. Okay, so that's how we deal with the universal quantifier. What about the existential? Well, actually, the rule is going to look pretty similar. We're going to take, there is an XA, we're going to extend our branch, and we're going to replace it with the sentence that looks exactly like A, except for we replace all the x's with a constant c. So far, it's exactly the same as the universal quantifier rule, but here's the difference. This constant c has to be a new constant, something we haven't used so far in that branch, okay? So we look down the branch, we look at all the constants that we've used, and we pick one that we haven't used so far. So if I have already used A, B and C, I might pick D. Now, to be precise here, the constant has to be new to the branch, not new to the tree as a whole. So it might be that I've got A, B and C in this branch and I've got D in some other branch. In that case, it would be OK to use D as a constant when I'm instantiating the existential quantifier. As long as it doesn't appear in this branch here, it's OK if it appears somewhere else in the tree. OK, so how does that rule work in practice? Well, let's take a really similar case to what we looked at before. We've got this branch, but instead of having universal quantifier in it, now we've got the existential quantifier in it. We want to instantiate this existential quantifier with a new constant. So we look at what we've got on the branch. Here we've got A, here we've got B, here we've got C. So I'm going to have to pick a new constant. I'm going to pick D and I'm going to add F, D to the branch. Again, I don't really need to add this line here. I'm just doing it to show you where the rule got applied. Now, in this case, I am going to tick that sentence off and say, I don't need to come back here. Why is that? Well, basically, if we're saying that something is F and we've decided to call that thing D, we're kind of picking an arbitrary name for the something that's F. I'm just going to call it D. D is a name that I haven't used before, so it's going to serve as an arbitrary name. OK, if you don't know what that means, you might want to look back at the videos on natural deduction. We're kind of doing a very similar thing here as we did in the natural deduction rules for the existential quantifier. OK, I hope I've linked those up here somewhere. But once we've introduced that arbitrary name to instantiate our existential, we don't need to do that again. OK, we only need to pick one arbitrary individual to be the thing, the something that is F, the something that is happy or whatever. We don't need a whole bunch of them and we shouldn't have a whole bunch of them. So once we've applied that rule, we better tick it off and say, don't use that rule again. So the only rule that we get to reuse is the positive rule for the universal quantifier. So there are our four rules for the quantifiers, the quantifiers and the negated quantifiers. Now we're going to look at the rules for identity. So the positive rule for identity is going to take two premises. One is going to be an identity sentence, like A is identical to B, and the other is going to be some sentence involving A. So let's just call that big A. My rule is going to tell me I can write down the sentence that's just like big A, but all the names A have been replaced by B's. 
So basically, I'm doing a substitution. It's like Leibniz's law, okay? If A is the same thing as B, then I can take anything I'm saying about A and say it about B as well, okay? If A is happy and A is the same thing as B, I can infer from that that B is happy. So in general, the way I capture that rule is I say, take any sentence, I can infer the very same sentence, but with all the A's replaced by B's. The negative rule for identity, when I've got a negated identity sentence, well, in general, if I've got A isn't identical to B, that doesn't really tell me very much at all. There's nothing I can do with that per se. So our rule is going to apply specifically when we've got a negated identity sentence like this. A is not the same thing as A. Okay, that should be a logical falsehood, right? It can't possibly be true because everything is identical to itself. So if we've got that, we're allowed to close that branch immediately. So this is quite a special rule. It allows us to close the branch in the same way that the contradiction rule allows us to close a branch. Okay, so if we've got A and not A, a sentence and the negated version of that sentence on the same branch, we can close that branch. We're adding another way to close a branch, and that is when we have a negated identity of the form A isn't the same thing as A. Let's just remember here that when we write this, this thing here isn't really a special logical symbol. It's the negation of an identity symbol. So writing it out properly, that sentence is this one here. It's not a primitive sentence. It's the negation of a primitive identity sentence. But we're just abbreviating it like that. That's basically what everyone does. OK, guys, so there you've got all the rules, all the new rules that you need to do proof trees for first order logic. Obviously, we haven't really said much about how to use them yet, so stick around. In the next couple of videos, I'm going to take you through some examples of how we put those rules into practice. Thank you so much for watching this far. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment down below. If you enjoyed it, give the video a big old thumbs up. That really helps me out. I hope you stick around for the next one.